our usual uh, plan for Fridays is to be a bit more interactive with examples. And so there's about, I think, eight or nine questions in the slides today to work our way through. But the questions aren't designed just to be questions. They're, uh, they're, they're a little bit, um, sometimes cut material we haven't seen yet, and so they're going to introduce new concepts as well. So it's not just, uh, just questions and, and applications. Uh, the main way to answer all the questions in the, in the material for this section is to have a very thorough understanding of this ternary diagram. So we saw yesterday in the video, we have two regions, this region up here, which is, contains mixtures which are totally visible to each other. They're a single phase, and then solution, oh, sorry, or any point in here with uh, mass, mass fractions in that envelope down here, those are two phase regions. So everything on this diagram is in mass fractions. That's the first key point, and we'll always work with mass flows or mass amounts. So when I refer here to the amounts of P and Q and K, those are kilograms. And the rule that we learned, uh, that you've seen in, in second year and in chemistry courses, it's easy to derive, it's called the Lieber rule, and it tells us that if we take two points, let's take for example P and Q, and I take a certain amount of P and Q and I combine them and fix them, I will find a new point K that is on a straight line connecting P and Q. Where along that straight line we fall is dependent on the amount of P and Q that we mixed. So in terms of this ratio, you have amount of Q in kilograms divided by the amount of P in kilograms. That is one side of the ratio is equal to that distance P and Q along the line over KQ. And so one easy easy way to remember this is that the numerators all contain three unique letters, P, K, and then Q, and then the denominators contain the three unique letters, K, Q, and then P. The converse also applies, so here we've mixed together, but we can also consider the case of separating. Or in other words, uh, if we conceptually see, if I take P plus Q, I'm going to get K. So P plus Q, I'm going to get a mixture K. That's true for the mass balance as well, of course. If I take a mass of P and Q and mix them, I'm going to get the total mass, capital K. But if I consider the opposite way around, which is how we will work with liquid liquid separations, if I take a mass K and I subtract from that K a certain amount with concentration Q, I will then be left over with the residual amount P with that concentration at the other end of the, of the line, given by the legal rule. So this, this rule applies, in fact, anywhere in the diagram, but the only place where you feasibly can subtract Q from K is in, this, in the immiscible region. Um, anywhere else, that, that doesn't really make sense. In fact, this rule applies not only in the diagram, but applies even outside the diagram, which may just seem totally counterintuitive to how you have mass fractions greater than 100%, but we'll see how that comes about conceptually later on. So let's work with this question then. Take a minute and convince yourself which of those two systems is more flexible um, in terms of the range of material that it can treat. So when I, by flexible there, I'm defining that to mean what is the system that A or B, the left or the right one, that is going to be able to be treat a wider variety of material. Consider the case then, uh, some more information, then that S is a pure solvent, and F is your feed concentration that you're going to provide to the liquid liquid extraction system. So just a, a bit of terminology here, we will place on the diagram these capital letters F, but strictly speaking, those capitals refer to the mass amounts. On this diagram, however, mass amount doesn't make sense. We're, this diagram is purely related to mass fractions. So a more correct way to specify that would be X subscript capital F. But we will always see in textbooks, um, we simply place X, the capital letter F there, and it's then assumed that that represents the flow, but also it's the concentration of the streams at that, in, that, in that stream F. Okay, so which of those two would you consider to be a more flexible system, and why? So I will uh, 
post the solutions to these answers later on, so you don't have to get everything down, but uh, I want you more to think about this one conception. We're taking a pure solvent S, that's one of the streams we're feeding to the liquid-liquid extraction. A is our solute that we're going to recover from that. F is our feed stream. So if we consider this system over here, if I combine the feed stream with that concentration of solute, so this is about 85% A would be in that feed stream, and I combine it with a pure solute, I'm going to get a mixture that lies somewhere along that line. If I take F and I work with a lower concentration of solute, so let's say F is placed over there approximately, so that's about a 50% concentration of solute, and I combine it with my solvent S, I'm going to obtain a mixture somewhere along that line in, in this two-phase region. If I take that same mixture F over here, which is about 50% of A, and let's transfer it over here. If I took that same feed and I combined it with the pure solvent, I would get a mixture somewhere along that line. But that line is purely in the miscible region. That any mixture of F with the pure solvent S over here would never separate into two phases. So from the flexibility point of view, in terms of the flexibility of treating certain feeds, this system over here on the right, on the left, sorry, is more desirable. It can treat a wider range of concentrations in my feed stream, all the way up to about 85% of solute, down to a very low percent of solute. And as I move that line F, it will pass and stay within the immiscible region. Whereas this region um, covers much, much smaller ranges of feed. In fact, we can only treat feed streams with a concentration of solute between about 0 and 30%. So less flexibility from the system on the right because that envelope of immiscible uh, operation, uh, sorry, immiscible uh, is so much smaller. And the reason why we would see this, these could be the same solutes and uh, carrier feed and, and solutes but you can modify this envelope's shape in several ways. Uh, for the same material, if I change the temperature, that envelope shape will, will change. And likely, if I increase the temperature, I will go from A to B. So we tend to get less um, separability or less immiscibility as we heat, heat up the material. That makes sense. We add in more energy. Those two phases tend to uh, come and stay as a single phase at higher temperatures. If I modify the pH in environment, I can also get these two phases that would originally be separate start to uh, come together and stay visible. Um, or, of course, this could be just a totally different choice of solvent A versus a totally different solvent choice B. But even for the same solvent, if I modify the temperature and pH, I can adjust that envelope shape and create and get less or more flexibility as a result of that. So the operating environment is important. The choice of solvents, as we saw in yesterday's class, is very important as well. Let's take a look at the next one. If I have a pure solute, uh, a solute A, so this is my material of interest that I aim to recover, and this is my phase diagram, or ternary diagram here, which is more effective as a solvent um, choice, C or S? Just bearing in mind the, the, the definition that we've seen for distribution <coughs> between two phases. This is not a trick question. The next one is. Yeah. S. Yes. 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 So S, where the lines slope up towards, we're going to get higher concentrations of the solute um, A carried in that solvent S than along. The same, here's my tie line, if the system comes to an equilibrium, the concentration of A in C is going to be lower than it would be in S. So S is a more effective solvent here than C is. I guess the legs kind of give that away. Okay, so here, let's take this um, question. If we take the feed stream, given my composition F, shown up there, or more correctly, we should say X subscript F. So that's the composition of F. It contains 
it seems about 40% um, of A, so and about 60% of C, if I had to estimate what F's composition is from this diagram, is about 40% of A and 60% C. And I'm combining that with a pure solvent stream S. So in other words, Y subscript S contains no solute. So there's no A in the solvent stream. What is the composition of the mixture after that? Left 
extract on the right. So that's correct. The, so the mixture M will equilibrate and spread along tie lines. Now there isn't a tie line through point M, so we interpolate one. So we create an interpolated tie line that's shown in the dashed lines over there. If it happened to fall on, if mixture M happened to fall on a, on a tie line already, um, I would then not need to construct it, and I would simply move to the two edges over there of the, of the miscibility envelope. But in this case, I would interpolate my best approximation of the tie line, and the raffinate R is the stream then in lower composition of solute. So R lower solute um, than the extract stream E, which is the higher solute. And once I have those two points, R and E, I can then read off the composition for solute is obviously this vertical distance, but then I can also read off the composition in the, of the raffinate stream. It contains very little solvents, so the solvent's composition is given along this direction. That R point would contain very low amounts of solvent, and then in terms of the carrier stream, I would read in this direction to estimate its composition. It would have a fairly high percentage by mass of the carrier in the raffinate, which makes sense. The raffinate stream is supposed to be the stream that contains primarily the carrier, the original feed, and a little bit of remaining solute. So over here we expect to see mainly feed or carrier as it's, as it's called, and small amounts of solute. Whereas my extract stream is primarily solvent and solute. So, so we introduced this terminology then yesterday that points along this side of the visibility curve are called the ex, it's called the extract envelope. And then points along this side are called uh, on the raffinate envelope. <coughs> okay, is that terminology clear? So this is a very important to understand these two uh, terms, the raffinate envelope and the, and the extract envelope and what the concentrations are expected to be along those lines. So is anyone unclear about the construction on why that splits into those two components, R and M? Okay. So make, make sure that, that that's, that's clear then, if, if it isn't for you. So it seems to be okay for most of you. Now, let's take this one. This one is, if you understand this one, you've understood this topic quite well. This is the conceptual question that's going to be in the final exam type of thing. If we take the same system that we just saw over there now, with that mixture M, and it equilibrates into an extract and a raffinate along the tie line, this company is spending some money on that solvent. That solvent is expensive. So they're mixing a certain amount of pure solvent that's expensive as well to, to use pure solvent. So this company wants to save some money and reduce the amount of solvent that they're using. What's going to happen to the extract concentration? So let's do this graphically. We're reducing the solvent. What's going to happen to my extract concentration? Concentration. We'll talk about the solute recovery in a minute, but first focus on what will happen to the extract concentration. For this system. This is not in general, but this will happen for this system on this diagram, what's going to happen. So take two, three minutes, talk with the person next to you for sure uh, to discuss what your approach is going to be to figure this one out. This is the key point you have to understand in this class.
There's two ways I can do that, and in fact I need to do both. MF must drop and MS must increase. And for MF to drop means that that point M must shift over to the left, as Tino said. And MS, the distance, must get larger. So both of those happen due to the constraint that they lie along the line. So the new point M for this newer mixture, once I start to use a slower flow rate of solvent into the system, that my new operating point for the mixture moves up to the left. What's going to then be the, uh, the question asked, what's the, going to be the extract concentration? So if my new point M lies up to the left, I can then find a new tie line to move across, and let's take, um, I've just taken it, my new point M start to land exactly on a tie line, just for conceptual convenience. So here's my new recovery point, and there's my new extract point. R star and E star. So, yes, my extract concentration increases because my concentration of solute at E star is a higher value. We're looking at the solute, so we're considering the vertical distance. E star lies above E, so absolutely my extract concentration, I'm getting a higher amount of solute in that extract stream leaving. So it's, it seems counterintuitive, but it, what happens is we're slowing down the amount of solvent we're putting in. We're putting in less solvent, so there's less material in, in there. The concentration then of solute that's going to get loaded into the solvent now, I've got less, solute, uh, less solvent, same amount of solvent coming in F, sorry, same amount of solute coming in F, I'm putting in less solvent, so the concentration of that solute in E must go up. So many of you got to the answer probably by that conceptual approach, but you can also see it then from, from this construction that it, it matches with what our expectation is ahead of time. The recovery is a little bit more subtle. The recovery is how much of the total solutes do we recover from the system? So how much of my solute is in the extract versus what I started off. Well, this recovery actually drops because what happens is my R star also goes up. R star is the concentration of solutes in my raffinate. That's undesirable. We want our raffinate to have a low or as low as possible concentration of solutes. We don't want any of that solute to go over into our raffinate stream. We want our raffinate stream to essentially be the carrier of material, water, or whatever we, we come in with in our feed. So we want our raffinate stream, our star, to actually be lower. The fact is that A, the concentration in our star is greater than what we were at originally. Okay, so in fact, our, our overall recovery drops. And there's another subtlety that I'll just mention, but I, I, it may, may not make sense at first. Even more uh, working against us, by, by trying this, this uh, reduction in solvent, what actually also ends up happening is not only does our recovery drop, the amount of R star that we get goes up. We get greater amounts of raffinate coming out. We can see that from the lever rule, this distance Me Star, M star, E star has increased, meaning that R star, the amount has increased. So we're, not, we're getting a lower recovery and high, high quantities of R star, high amounts of R star. So, so it works against us trying to do that. Now in the limit, there is a limitation to, to what, we, what we're doing here. If I keep reducing my solvent lower and lower and lower, so if I keep dropping S, I'm going to move along this line eventually until I reach that point right over there. That's, that's my lowest amount of solvent I can ever feed to the system. For a given flow rate, uh, sorry, for a given feed composition F, that's my, my op critical point. I can't operate beyond that. If I keep going and reducing my solvent, I will then land up in a single phase point of operation. Also, 
you could see that conceptually that operating right at this point you get me almost no separation. So trying to reduce your solvent is one way to save money, but essentially you're going to need a larger and larger piece of equipment then to, to obtain the recovery you want. Okay, so it's important to understand those uh, conceptual ideas and, and see how they come from this ternary diagram. Let's take a look now at a, at a more numeric answer. So this one you should be able to solve in no time. Um, now, but, but we're now putting numbers to it. So the previous slides were all on uh, just where concept, concept of where the points fall. Here you can actually quantify it. So let's take our feed F and our solvent S. And there's the compositions of my feed and my solvent. So for that given composition and for those given flows, 250 kilograms of feed and 100 kilograms of solvent, find for me where the mixture lies. So we're not considering the raffinates and the extract yet, that will come up next. First find where the mixture of those two will lie and what the composition of that point is, points are. You can do this analytically or graphically. So I would, I would uh, ask you to do both in fact prove to yourself that you can get roughly the same answers graphically and analytically.
So if we're trying to do that graphically, uh, we then say something along the lines of the leading rule Fm, the distance from F to M over the distance M to S, that's equal to the amount of S divided by the amount of F, which both of those we know, so that's 100 divided by 250. <coughs> So that gives you a value of 0.4. But in fact, that's not too helpful because it's saying that the distance f to m divided by the distance m to s is 0.4. Notice that it's not saying that this point m is 40% over the longer line. That's not the correct interpretation. It's saying fm, that distance f to m, divided by the distance m to s is 0.4, just is the ratio of those two distances. What is a bit more helpful actually is if we could find what is that distance fm over the total distance sf. Okay, so that's more of a fraction that's helpful because then I can take my ruler and measure the total length f to s, which I know, and then just find the percentage of the distance along that line f to m. So that's equal then fm is the same as the amount of s divided by sf, which is the amount of m. That's readily calculated. So I've got 100 kilograms of s. The amount of mixture I have is 350. So that gets me a number of 0.29. So that point M is roughly 30% or 29% along the distance of that line. So that's how I can locate M. And once I've located M, I can read off graphically the compositions. So Xm of the solute A is roughly 0.17. Um, the compass, oh, okay, it's up here on the board. So Xm of the carrier is 0.54, so 54% uh, of carrier. So if we look along the carrier direction, 10, 20, 30, 40, 54%. And of the solvent, we're looking along this direction here, so that's 10, 20, 30, odd percent solvent, 29. Okay, so, sorry. So, so that's how to read it off graphically. If you wanted to do it analytically, it's a simple mass balance. Um, we're saying that the amount of solute in my feed, so amount of solute in feed XFA that's given to me multiplied by my feed plus the amount of solute in my solvent, so XSA, uh, the time of the solvent, is equal to the amount of solute A in the mixture. So I'm doing a mass balance on my two entry streams and then the resulting mixture that I get in the tank. XSA is zero, so that I can disregard that term and then simply solve for X and A, which is then 0.24 times 250 divided 350, which is where So then you can repeat that for the carrier and you can repeat that for the solvent. So just do a, a, a mass balance on the individual species. You can just do a mass balance on two of the species and then find the third by difference from one. So graphically or analytically, you should get approximately the same values. Then we're asking now, what is going to be the composition of, let's take mixture M and allow it to equilibrate into two phases. What is going to be the composition of the single stage mix assembler for the extract and the raffinate? We're just going to deal with single stages in today's class. Next class, we're going to then take and combine these stages together. So I'm just building you up to how we're going to work with this for multiple stages. Because we have to have an excellent understanding of the single stage first, though, before we get to that point. 
the what is going to be the composition of the extract and then the raffinate. And what are going to also be the quantities of the extract and raffinate that we will find. Okay, so for those of you that have already found the answer, uh, while we just wait for everyone else to, to catch up, what you can do is take your answer and then put it into a second mixer settler with some fresh solvent and calculate the second extract and the second reference. So now cascade it down into a second unit. For those of you that are, uh, want to keep working on something while, while I can just wait for everyone else to finish up here. So we'll call this one R1 and this E1. So it's the raffinate and the extract from the first unit. Then we'll put some fresh solvent in here. Where are we going to land then on that second one? So we'll, we'll look at that one uh, later on, but you can just start working on it in the meantime. Point M, 
and we're going to equilibrate along that line. And I've interpolated close to the tie line that's nearby. And we get our extract over here. Our extract contains a higher concentration of solute. So it's, this is this time around on the diagram, this is my extract envelope. And on this, uh, this time around, this is my raffinate envelope. So you, it's not always on the same side. It really just depends on how the diagram is being drawn. So in this case, my extract is a higher percentage solute, so that's um, my extract envelope. Once I've found that point, and if this is the, the, the way to do this is graphically, so everyone's going to get slightly different answers. So your answers should agree approximately with those shown here, depending on, on the lines that you've drawn in your reading of the, of the figure. So let's just take a look at one of them. Uh, that blue point over here, R1, the raffinate, it's 10% in A, so that's right on the line, so that one's easy to read. In terms of carrier, so my, this is my carrier direction here, that's about 82%, I've estimated. So there's 80, 90, so about 82%, and then solvent then by, by it is the difference from one. So I can verify it fit, uh, in the figure, but it's, it's about one. Uh, sorry, 0 0.08. So here's 10%, so it's at about 8% up along that direction in solvent. So that's my raffinate stream. And that makes sense. Uh, the raffinate stream should contain very low amounts of the solute. So it only contains 10% of the solute in this case. My extract stream here, I've estimated them to be about 33% of the solute. Very low amounts of carrier in, in that stream, which is expected. And then the, the raffinate stream contains a lot of solvent. Where the extract stream contains a lot of solvent. So my extract stream, higher concentration solvent than R1. Yes? Sorry, I don't think 10% would be solvent. That's 10% of the solute. So, yeah, sorry, uh, so this is my solute direction. And so 0, 10. So along the first line. So there's my 10%. That 10 refers to the distance. Okay, so it's easy to get the compositions. How do you get the flows? How do I calculate R1 and E1? Okay. So to get those, what you can do is, is, is as follows. Uh, you can do a balance over the, over the diagram. So if we just look at the, I'm just going to look at the carrier balance. So I can say X, F, what is my carrier percentage in my feed times F, plus what is the carrier percentage in my solvent times the solvent flow is equal to the carrier in my extract, X, E1, times E1 <coughs> plus the carrier in my raffinate. Okay, so I can do a mass balance on that. That gets me, uh, let's just plug in the numbers here, 0.76 times 250 plus 0 is equal to 0 0.82 E1 plus 0 0.06 R1. So there's one equation in two unknowns, E1 and R1. Okay. I can then pick one of my other, other streams. I've done this for the carrier. But I could do this now repeated for, say, the solute, do a mass balance on the solute. And then I get two equations in two unknowns and uh, solve for them. Or the other, other way I could do it is simply recognize that E1 plus R1 must equal to m, and I know what m is already. So there's my other equation. So here's one equation, here's my second equation, two equations, and two unknowns. Linear equations, Gauss reduction, you plug one into the other and you solve, and you will then find that E1 is 128 kilos, and R1 is 222 kilos. You have to do this, this type of question, you have to do graphically and analytically. Okay, so we've got a little bit of time, I apologize for that.